This episode is brought to you by Communications Training for Coffee Teams, a new Mapper Forward workshop tailored to get your team communicating more confidently to improve general mental health as well as business profitability. Click the link in the show notes for further details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode four of our five part series with Andres Felipe Ospina. Um, Andres Felipe, we are talking about. Uh, ecosystems and invasive species and coffee production, in particular, the dangerous impact um, that foreign microbes have in coffee production. And we've talked about it from the, the producer's end in the first three episodes. In this episode of the series, we want to talk about the role that coffee roasters and baristas and traders are playing in um, the dangerous impact that these microbes are having. So how does the coffee roaster, the brewster, and the trader participate in microbes having a dangerous impact in coffee production? Okay. I think they are playing one of the main roles here. Um, um, regardless, they know what are the implications or not. Um, one of the things is, uh, first of all, many of these microbes that are being brought to other countries are being smuggled. If you, for example, just I'm just going to make a little bit of uh, the, the for what is coming, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's not it's not fun. It, it should not be done. It's illegal in most cases in many countries. Uh, I, if you, they declare this, uh, there is no way the local authorities will let them in with that. Um, wow. The commercial, bar, uh, the commercial east. Uh, they have a loop to go. That loop is due to a lack of research in tropical mi microbiology. Um, microbio we, we have something in biology, part of the biology called taxonomy. Taxonomy is the part of biology that um, is in charge of naming different uh, living organisms and saying this is A, this is B, this is C, or so on. And is like that because this and this and that. And there are many different uh, aspects that we take into taxonomy when we are going to describe a new species or a new variety and so on. Mm -hmm. In terms of microbes, we call them Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And as you can see, the variety is going to be a number. That number is just showing us that taxonomy is still not there. And we cannot, because that number is there, and we put the name of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, is not going. It's going to be the same one that is locally. It's not. Mm -hmm. The, as a matter of fact, we don't even have the numbers for the local ones yet because we wow. haven't studied. Okay, so that's one of the reasons that we can take here, for example, of loss of diversity because those local numbers will be erased. Mm -hmm. Being said, the role of these coffee, I would like to call them coffee enthusiasts because they are very enthusiastic and they are really in this frenetic thing of having the new, new, new gig to sell. They, they are using marketing strategies to go through it. Marketing strategies that many times are not real. They are just calling things with weird names <laughs> when sometimes it could be something very basic or when something cannot even exist. But it's something in which all of us does, even me, I have to put good names into my processing because otherwise they won't be attractive enough for the market, right? So let's say it's, it's this new trend where we want to go, not only that Juan Perez is producing a beautiful coffee in his farm at 1,900 meters in this little mm, town, it's, it's more about Juan Perez, how many hours of fermentation is doing to this and this, and then this, he's doing the triple fermentation and the Martian fermentation and all of these weird fermentations that comes as a marketing tool. So let's say this interaction is not only traders and roasters and baristas, the ones, they have an interaction with the local ones and the local ones are the ones that are copying this. But what I come here is to a social perspective of what it is. And mm -hmm. it comes to uh, the real fact of we still live in a colonialism institution when we call about coffee. When we see, for example, what is happening in coffee. When you, when you, when you see what is 
the amount of coffee that is in one cup of coffee, the green one, the value of that green one, and you put the equation of how much cost to produce this cup of coffee, those cents of the green you can put in or out. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. It's not going to cost, uh, no, not going to alter the whole equation of how mm -hmm. much it costs to produce this. But it also has probably 80% of the manpower it takes to produce this cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. That's going to be right there. And coffee has been creating more poverty over centuries, okay? So I know a lot of people is, okay, we are going to go and help farmers to do this. But they come with something that is self, they, they lack of self-awareness of what is the impact that I will have in a farmer, me being a roaster, telling him, put this yeast or put this organism into your fermentation because I will buy it. Mm -hmm. Without what, any what understanding. That's, yeah. not, that's, not, that's not asking for a favor. That's ordering to him to do it, even if you don't want. That's the reality of things. There will be very few farmers that are going to say no. They are... They will probably not say no because first they will need the money. And second, they will not say no because they don't have the knowledge that that microbe that he's receiving could alter his farm forever. Okay? Wow. So they are not going to be able to say. It. So it's in the role of the barista, it's in the role of the roaster or the trader to be aware of how powerful are his or her actions and what a favor means to a farmer. It's not a favor, okay? And what comes along with this is the destruction of the terroir and the possibility of that farmer to produce a unique coffee in the future. And it's coming, which is kind of weird, is this, all this trend is actually going backwards into what coffee, specialty coffee industry has been done. We will always very, very uh, happy with and excited with new coffees. That was in the first place what, helps the specialty coffee industry to be born mm -hmm. but now because a lot of people wants to take uh, the trend of bringing these microbes they don't even know that they are going to probably alter so much the terroir and make the whole planet one only terroir that the production of unique coffees is going to be loose forever and that's the main goal of the of the farmer that they are trying to help so it's, it's a contradiction, it's, it's a philosophical contradiction, it's an economical contradiction, it's a market contradiction, mm -hmm. it's probably an ideological contradiction, and it's probably a contradiction to the goodwill of people, mm -hmm. because they may be doing it with goodwill, but not knowing what is going to happen, then it's a contradiction because the contrary thing is going to happen, you know what I mean? Very so, much. yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think the role of them is, is very active right now. They are the ones bringing this. I was in Russia last week mm -hmm. and I remember I was telling them because I saw they are doing this a lot of kombucha, things like that with something that they call uh, the tea fungus and they have different things that they do these fermentations and they are like kind of raw fermentations that they have like ready to drink things. And I said, oh, I hope you guys don't even think about bringing this to Colombia because this will be crazy. Well, that day I went to a party at night and mm -hmm. they told me very, oh, yeah, it's my colleague just brought one. Oh, no. <laughs> but Colombia to start a new fermentation over there with the farmers. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is just not stopping and it's crazy, you know. So probably, yeah, the people is very excited about producing new coffees, but they just don't know that those actions can be very contraproducent and that they are illegal, you know? It, it's really interesting that you say that ab about it being illegal. So there's a, a couple of really important things to take away from this. One, uh, we're breaking the law when we take different strains of microbes to coffee-producing countries where those um, microbes are not native and we're doing it because we're trying to create the next fad in coffee or help the next person win a competition. Um, and, and that's a lot of what's driving a lot of this kind of, and I'm saying this in inverted commas, innovation, because we're trying to make these things innovative so that they can be set a stage on a barista stage. And yeah. at the end of the day, 
this is destroying the long term. It's it's having a destructive impact on the long term of coffee production and we're not paying attention to it. And I wouldn't say even it's that long. Microbes grow quite quickly. You okay. see a fermentation up in 24 hours, 48 hours, 72. So it's, it's not that long, you know? Um, but the, if you don't mind me asking, it, it, can yeah. I just ask you a question there? So let's say something like koji gets into the waterways. Does it erode the 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 flora and the fauna that's in the waterways? Do we know that yet? In, sorry, I, I didn't get it. it Let, let's what? say let's say koji spores get into the local rivers in Colombia. Let's say the Japanese <laughs> koji gets into the local rivers. The spores get in there. How mm. likely is that to become a problem? Killing fish, killing. Um... Okay, listen. For example, one of the things is we have found that um, although communities of microbes seems to be quite not super diverse in terms of genetics, but I think there are just not enough studies. Just some studies happen to show that. Um, but it's still, we, we have seen in the composition, which is what we do because we have very basic lab. So we can see the composition of the community is kind of every 100, every 100 millimeters in altitude changes a lot, mm -hmm. 60%, so on. So it changes a lot. Um, it, it, it also gives us the hint that many microbes are quite localized in what they do. They cannot go, for example, from 2,000 meters to 5,000 meters, cross the ice and to the other side of the right. mountains. No, it's not nothing that happens. Nevertheless, subtropical microbes as koji or Saccharomyces cerevisiae from subtropical lands, they can go through very cold winter to very hot summers. Right. For them, tropic the permanent stream is spring forever. So mm -hmm. it's, they are going to be producing forever. That's why I don't think that could be something that is in such a long term. In a few years, we could start to see the forest becoming brown and we don't know why. And it's because they have killed most of the microbes. And this is very important. We talk about, for example, invasive species being one of the reasons of most, more extinctions in the planet right now. But they are superior beings, plants and animals being introduced into the ecosystem that in the superior level creates extinction. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about microbes, all the ecosystem is based in the micro microbiological ecosystem. And if we start to create here extinction, then what we can see is all the balance in which these hyper-diverse uh, forests are based is going to collapse. And if it collapses, everything will collapse. Mm. So if something that goes beyond, like, could be potentially much worse than global warming, it can go faster than global warming, and it's something that we haven't done before, you know? So... I think is is the, the the issue is quite it's, it's not. I remember one guy talking it's a about big deal. one. Of, <laughs> you know, like I remember because it, I was in the sky. I was not. Uh, now I'm a lecturer for the sky, but well, for the SEA. Before I was someone in the audience, right? And I remember someone, and I asked him, but this is very dangerous for the environment. He's like, what are you talking about? The man has always got the bread under one arm and, and with the, the wine, wine in the other. Yeah, and I'm like, oh my God, but the, the, the bread, you bake it and the wine, you drink it. And also it has a lot of alcohol that kills the same microbes and it's produced in France and those microbes is there the day. You know, it's not the same than in coffee. Like for example, in washed coffee, one ton of coffee can pollute as much as 2000 houses. That's a lot of waste water that we are using there. Imagine how many microbes can go. And as you say, if it goes to the river, what is the geographical dispersion of this? It's going to be for hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers. And who is going to clean this mess later? That's what I mean You're by the long-term impact, right? No, it's no way to clean it. Mm -hmm. And is it going to kill fish? Maybe it's not going to kill fish, but for sure it's going to kill other microbes. Upstream or downstream, but that it will kill other microbes? Yes. Will it bring it to extinction? Well, I don't know. Could be, you know? So wow. there is something that we call principle of precaution here. Mm -hmm. And it's a very important principle in pretty much in any law in any country, mm -hmm. that if something can be harmful for the environment or for the human health, 
you should reframe our doing it mm -hmm. until it's proven. So here, companies that are producing uh, these commercial microbes should be the ones first doing the impact the in our industry because we are not producing these in factories. We are producing mm -hmm. these in the upper air next to rivers and forests. They have to come and show us this is not danger to no one. It's not going to change the genetical composition of local species, which could be the least uh, impact it has. But it's not like they, they are laughing about it somehow. I'm saying I'm laughing because I got laughed off. So wow. when, you, when you bring this kind of uh, scientific arguments and then you have a lot of local guys, even in the position saying, well, if the market asks for it, we will do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there, there is a lot of other issues here that have to be with transparency, but also ethics, you know? Uh, totally. And, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's okay. Yeah. Folks, if you get the opportunity to go to one of Andreas Felipe's workshops, go, because this is where he talks about a lot of this stuff and your mind will be blown. Um, yeah. And, and you have amazing conversation afterwards. Talking about amazing conversations, we've got one episode left of this series. And in, the, in this next one, we're going to talk about international and local regulation around all this stuff. So join us for the last episode of this series. Peace, love and peanut butter, folks. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks for tuning in, friends. There are two ways you can support this podcast. Firstly, become a paid member of our YouTube channel. Secondly, you can join our Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video before you leave and check the show notes for more information. Now, this is what you should check out next.